For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Thomas. And for those of you who do know me, I'm still Dave Thomas. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be a great show because I feel good, nice and relaxed, and I know why. I just saw my favorite movie of all time in the dressing room, The Man Who Would Be King, starring Sean Connery and, of course, Mr. Relaxation himself, Michael Caine. Boy, he really makes acting look easy and effortless. And, of course, why wouldn't I? At this point in my life, I've starred in just about every bloody movie ever made. So, I mean, if I can't make it effortless, I don't know who can. I saw him one time on television being criticized by a critic uh, for one of the not-so-good movies that he did. And uh, I loved his response. He said, look, I'm just an actor for hire. If you don't like the movies I do, why don't you go off and write me a script and I'll be in your movie. That's it, mate. <laughs> it's the perfect attitude, and I disagree with that critic. I think Michael Caine, just by being in a movie, makes it great. No matter what the situation, no matter what the character, he seems to be able to pull it off. For example, I had an idea for a really bizarre movie where an average businessman is, is caught up in a Middle East war zone. He, he survives an airplane crash, but he's, he's trapped in his chair and he can't get out. Well, okay, I haven't got the whole thing worked out, but that's the point. Michael Caine could make this idea work. He survived a plane crash, only to find himself trapped in a Middle East war zone. I want to speak to the pilot. Come on, you call that a bloody landing? Oh, wait a minute. Where is everybody? Day two. I've got to find myself something to eat and a gun. And then I've got to blast my bloody way out of here. Identified only by his seat number, he became a legend in the Middle East. I'll teach you to mess with business class. Out of a chair, but now I'm gonna make myself airborne. Heads up! Bloody glad I didn't fly first class, otherwise, I'd have had to lug around that great big seat, I would have broken my back. <laughs> anyway, so where are they keeping the rest of the POWs? Well, uh, oh, it's kind of hard to see. Oh, sorry. There. Is that better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's okay. Did you want something, sir? Sorry, love, I must have pushed your button by mistake. Uh, but while you're here, uh, can I get a scotch? Sure. Would, would you blokes like something to eat? Oh, yeah, we haven't eaten in a long time. Well, we're all out of the steak, but we still have the chicken piccata. I know me. Take good care of them. What about you? Oh, I'm going back in, mates. Don't worry about me. As long as there's Americans in there, I'm going to be the one to get them out. Uh, I can't do this. Sorry, Dave. I mean, great as I am at pulling rank smellers out of the fire, this one is too much even for me. I mean, you know, it's patently absurd. I know I'm supposed to be strapped in this seat, but, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, couldn't I just get a knife and cut myself out? Sorry, Dave. Don't mean to let you down, darling. Thanks for thinking of me. Maybe on the next one. All right, prop, somebody get me out of this thing. Come on, I've got to get out. Here, help me with this. Will you, darling? Come on, let's go. Let's go with it, Dave. Sorry, Dave. Maybe on the next one, huh, darling? Oh, hi. You all know my guest, country and western singer great Johnny J. Folsom. Howdy, folks. Pleasure to be here. Anyway, Johnny, you look great. I feel pretty good, Dave, I'll tell you. Although I did have a bad bout uh, about six months ago there. 
Yeah, I read that. I, I heard you were institutionalized for caffeine abuse. <laughs> oh, yeah, Dave. When I was at my worst, I was drinking upwards of 150 cups of coffee a day. Didn't you have a, a marriage earlier that uh, kind of went sour? Or? Yeah, well, that's a tragedy, Dave. Uh, I was married for four years to Geraldine. Uh, we were driving on a West Virginia road one night, and uh, uh, I never should have swerved for that chipmunk. The car just spun out of control and went off a bridge and plunged into the ice. And uh, they fished me out of the water. I, I'd been there for like six hours, and I had severe hypothermia. But uh, they were able to revive me, and during that time of, of being clinically dead, I saw my ma at the end of a white tunnel. And I never wanted to be revived. I never wanted to come back. And, uh, I had a little visit with her. The only time in my life was when I was clinically dead. And Geraldine, well, they never found her. Weren't you revived that day coming out of the water with coffee? Yeah, that's right. That was a, a, a double mistake, I believe, the doctors made. They never knowed that I'd that I was going to crash like that. How many times have you been institutionalized? I've been institutionalized uh, 56 times, Dave. Well, Johnny, a lot of your albums are about your ma, right? Yeah, every one of my albums deals with my ma. Uh, I got uh, 28 albums out, and they're all about ma. And I understand you're going to sing one of those songs for us tonight, huh, Johnny? Yeah, that's right. It's called Ma, I'm a-coming. It tells the story of my ma and the night they fried her in the electric chair. Really? <laughs> She's real pretty, Johnny. Yeah. Everybody said she was a real looker. Anyhow, and, uh, they fried her in the electric chair. Me and the blue mountain boys went up just to, just to say goodbye one last time. So I'd meet her, you know. Anyway, um, Warden wouldn't let us in just because we was wearing blue jeans. Well, that's not fair. That ain't fair, Dave. Country boys wearing jeans. I mean, what, what more normal thing would be than that? I wrote this song to protest against dress codes at electrocutions, especially when it involves the next of kin. I'd like to sing that song for you right now. Now to sing one of his own songs, Ma, I'm a-comin'. Here is the great Johnny J. Folsom. I'm Johnny J. Folsom, and I was born in jail. Pushing on the pedal, and I'm almost out of gas. They say they're gonna fry it, and I hope I'm there in time to find out who my daddy was and hold your hand in mine. He's Mr. Warden, that's my mom. Footsteps leading to the electric chair She didn't mean to kill no one Or cause them any pain If she'd had a decent lawyer He'd have said she was insane Now I hear the preacher As he leads her from her cell Where mama tried to raise me Hoping I would turn out well You gotta let me see him. She's my only mother And I gotta say goodbye You're fading fast I'm hitting the double nickel And I'm almost out again They say they're gonna fry you And I hope I'm there in time To find out who my daddy was And hold your, and hold your hand in mine Sorry, boys Please, Mr. Warden you gotta let me in To miss a mother's execution Surely is a sin I know to you I'm poorly dressed And these ain't proper clothes But cowboy jeans and hats Is all a country singer knows And now I hear the preacher As he reads that final prayer They're cooking those electrodes Into her old silver hair Before they pull the 
switch She's my dear old mama, not just some old stinky Let's see my boss, she's sitting right where you're sitting there. She looked like the night they fried her. First she's right there, then she's right there. I can't take it no more. I lose my mind, oh Lord. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very sorry. I have really no idea what happened there, except that maybe it's a lesson for all of us about drinking too much coffee. Um, right now, <laughs> a comedy scene. In 1965, Dr. Norman Wiles, PQ, and I landed off the coast of New Guinea in search of the legendary Bully Tutsa tribe, the strange, primitive root eaters of a long lost civilization. Look at this. The hillside is covered with this stuff. Look, look at this. Look, over here. <laughs> oh my God. It's a giant shoe. That settles it. We must turn back. You're right. It's too risky. If these people are hostile, they could crush us like bugs. Look, over here. Someone help me with this. Come on. Fellas, down here. What is it, Norman? What did you find? It looks like a, a flag. A flag? No, no, it's more like a tent. Good grief. Wait a minute. It looks like a... Is it? It is. Oh, oh. Gentlemen, maybe we shouldn't turn back. I mean, we are scientists. We have a certain responsibility to this expedition, don't you think? We'd be cowards to give up now. We should study them, learn their ways. Well, fine. Then let's go find these giant misshapen beasts. Come on. Can I carry this? Yes, I'll help you. In a moment, tonight's winning lottery numbers. Remember, tonight's jackpot is 17 and one half million dollars. Well, here's my ticket and the ticket I bought for Bob. Well, good luck to us. And the winning numbers are 1, 10, 22, 26, 40, and 43. Okay, first I'll check my ticket. 20, oh, 22, no, I didn't get that, 35, no, oh, gee, not one number, I lost, well, may as well check poor old Bob's ticket, I bet he didn't do much better, one, yeah, good, 10, good, 20, 22, 22, 26, 26, 43, a lot of money. Maybe I ought to check them again. I wouldn't want to get them mixed up. Yeah, I'll check them again. First I'll check Bob's. Okay. Um, two, no, 20, uh-uh, 35. Oh. oh, Bob, rough break, Bob. You lost. Oh. And I got you once. Too bad, Bob. Well, I was wrong about Bob. Maybe I was wrong about me. I'll check mine again. One. Mm-hmm. Lucky so far, ten. Yeah. Twenty-two. Oh. Twenty-six. Forty. Forty-three. I won! <laughs> I won! I'm rich! I'm rich! I'm rich! I'm rich. I won! It's a noise. What is it? Is that you, Bob? You're out there, aren't you? You're trying to drive me crazy. You lost, I tell you, you lost. I'm the winning ticket. I swear I never switched from I swear it. Bob, show your face, be a man. Don't do this to me, Bob. I'm in the breaking point. I'll get it, go. We'll be right back after these very important messages. <laughs>